Napoleon attracted him tremendously. That is, what affected him was that a great many men of genius have not hesitated at wrongdoing, but have overstepped the law without thinking about it. In 19th century St. Petersburg, an elderly woman gets violently murdered by an impoverished and antisocial law student named Raskolnikov. So begins the landmark novel of Fyodor Dostoevsky, Crime and Punishment. Some 50 years have passed since the time of Napoleon's disastrous invasion of Russia in 1812, but the specter of the French emperor still looms over the entire novel. Its protagonist, Raskolnikov, idolizes the man. But behind the character Raskolnikov and his admiration stands the writer, Dostoevsky, and his condemnation. Between the interplay of these opposite forces, we can arrive at a picture of the man and the phenomenon of Napoleon Bonaparte and the role of great men in shaping history. That will be the subject of today's video. Lovers of Russian literature, of course, know that Napoleon plays a significant role in another one of the great Russian novels, Tolstoy's War and Peace. There's a video coming out about that too, so please subscribe if you don't want to miss it. With that out of the way, Let's dive into 19th century St. Petersburg and into the mind of one of literature's most psychologically fascinating characters, Dostoevsky's Rodion Raskolnikov. Raskolnikov is an impoverished law student living in St. Petersburg. A combination of events and thought processes finds him in the apartment of an old lady, a pawnbroker of considerable wealth. He attacks her with an axe, killing her. The woman's half-sister is an unexpected witness to the crime, and Raskolnikov kills her as well. Fleeing the scene of the crime, he takes only a handful of items with him, leaving the largesse of the lady's wealth untouched. The rest of the novel deals with the consequences of this murder, how it troubles Raskolnikov's mind, how he justifies the act to himself, but ultimately how the crime weighs on his conscience. Dostoevsky takes a masterful psychological deep dive into the mind of his protagonist. The novel is not simply about a Russian student named Raskolnikov and how he deals with this specific situation. The novel is about the human condition as such, how we move in the world, how we justify ourselves to ourselves, how the human mind operates. Raskolnikov has committed a heinous crime. Pangs of conscience eat away at him. He desperately needs a justification so that he may live with himself. That is where Napoleon comes in. You see, Raskolnikov spends a large part of the novel idolizing Napoleon and other great men like him, men of action who bend the world to their will, who stop at nothing to achieve their goals, who trample over the great hordes of men, those who reach out over the world and dominate it. He spends considerable time theorizing on the role of so-called great men, about their role in shaping history, their conception of morality, and their function in society. But we must make an important distinction between Raskolnikov, the fictional protagonist in the novel, and Dostoevsky, the author of that novel. Typical of Dostoevsky, he assigns different beliefs and worldviews to the characters in his novels, and then puts them against each other in long conversations. And it is the strength of Dostoevsky that even if Dostoevsky himself disagrees with his characters, they make a strong case for their position anyway. The best example of this, in my opinion, is Ivan Karamazov from The Brothers Karamazov. The worldview of the atheistic Ivan is far removed from that of Dostoevsky himself, but his arguments, reasons and motivations are as realistic and faithfully represented as they come. The same holds true of Raskolnikov. When Raskolnikov talks about Napoleon and other great men, he puts forward reasons and arguments. He's convincing. He's persuasive, but we know the psychological mechanism behind them. At the end of the day, all that he's doing is trying to find a justification, any justification, for his crime, so that he may find some peace. Of course, it's not through cold reason and rationality and philosophy that Raskolnikov finds his redemption, but we'll get to that. First, let's see what Raskolnikov has to say. Thankfully, the philosophical views of Raskolnikov are more or less completely spelled out for us. That's because in the course of the novel, Raskolnikov gets drilled by a detective on an article that he wrote titled On Crime. We don't read Raskolnikov's actual article in the novel, but we become acquainted with it through conversations he has with other characters. 
The fundamental thesis in Raskolnikov's article is that humans can be divided in two groups, the large group of ordinary men and the small group of extraordinary men. He makes the case that these extraordinary men have a certain right to commit crimes, if such a crime would be essential for the fulfillment of their idea. He gives the example of Isaac Newton. I maintain that if the discoveries of Kepler and Newton could not have been made known, except by sacrificing the lives of one, a dozen, a hundred, or more men, Newton would have had every right, would indeed have been duty-bound, to eliminate the dozen or the hundred men for the sake of making his discoveries known to the whole of humanity. Newton is an example of an extraordinary man because he had an idea, a vague term Raskolnikov uses but that will be more fleshed out later, an idea that needed promulgation. The gift that Newton bestowed upon mankind, his discoveries in physics, have been of such a tremendous help for humanity that, if circumstances had required Newton to sacrifice the lives of others for the publication of his theories, he would have been justified in doing so. In the case of Newton, it's quite obvious that his idea, his contribution to mankind, was of monumental importance. But things get murkier when we discuss other historical figures. And Raskolnikov, as he is explaining his views to the detective in the scene, already backtracks a little bit. It's Dostoevsky's way of showing that Raskolnikov is not really engaging in an honest philosophical debate, but that he is only trying to justify his own murder to himself. Because Raskolnikov himself is obviously not a man of Newton's caliber. So, very sneakily, he expands his concept of an idea until it comes to mean almost anything. And he expands the definition of extraordinary or great as well. He sneaks in a little disclaimer and says that whatever he is saying not only applies to great men such as Newton, but also to men a little out of the common. In short, I maintain that all great men, or even men a little out of the common, that is to say, capable of giving some new word, must from their very nature be criminals. You see immediately how Raskolnikov's grand thesis starts to get watered down. We started out with great, extraordinary men such as Newton, whose monumental contributions to mankind would justify Newton's hypothetical criminal behavior. But soon afterwards, it's not about great men anymore, but simply men out of the common. And it's not about monumental contributions anymore either, but about giving some new word. Sure, we might take Raskolnikov seriously and agree with him that Newton was such an important man that we might reasonably forgive him for any hypothetical crimes he committed. But now Raskolnikov wants us to have the same leeway towards himself as well, an impoverished student who never amounted to anything. It becomes increasingly clear that Raskolnikov only uses his philosophy to try and justify the murder he's committed, and that he seeks salvation through the forgiveness that we would grant great men of history. But he is no great man of history. He's just Raskolnikov. But in any case, what does Napoleon have to do with any of this? Napoleon is another example of the type of great man that Raskolnikov talks about. Remember how Raskolnikov defines a great man, someone who has a new idea or others a new word. To him, an individual is extraordinary by virtue of bringing into the world something new, something different. Newton's contributions are his scientific discoveries. Napoleon did something of a different category. Napoleon was not a man of science, but a man of conquest, war, but most importantly, for Raskolnikov's argument, a man of law. Napoleon's greatness lies in his capacity as a lawgiver. This is why Raskolnikov mentions Napoleon alongside the likes of Solon of Athens, an archaic Athenian lawgiver and one of the seven sages of Greece, and Lycurgus, his Spartan counterpart. But to lay down a law and create a new legal system, the old system must be uprooted and abolished. The old law, in other words, must be broken. This makes the lawmaker, by definition, a criminal. So Napoleon is different from Newton not simply due to the category of their contributions, law versus science, but Napoleon is also different from Newton in the sense that Napoleon was an actual criminal. That is to say, at one point, Napoleon broke the laws of France. This makes Napoleon a much more relevant example for what Raskolnikov is trying to do, namely, subconsciously justify his crime. 
In short, Raskolnikov is saying that Napoleon's shedding of blood was worth it because of his impact on history and the advancement of humanity that he caused. Recall the example of Newton. Raskolnikov argued that in theory, hypothetically, Newton would have been justified in shedding blood if doing so was required for him to publish his theories and leave his mark on history and culture. Well, in the example of Napoleon, we don't need to think of hypothetical scenarios. The bloodshed has already happened. The question is, was it worth it? Raskolnikov seems to think it was. Napoleon had sufficiently great ideas for the advancement of mankind that his criminal, violent behavior is justified after the fact. But if such a one is forced for the sake of his idea to step over a corpse or wade through blood, he can, I maintain, find within himself, in his conscience, a sanction for wading through blood. That depends on the idea and its dimensions, note that. It's only in that sense I speak of their right to crime in my article. He summarizes the life and immorality of Napoleon as follows. The real master, to whom all is permitted, storms Toulon, makes a massacre in Paris, forgets an army in Egypt, wastes half a million men in the Moscow expedition, and gets off with a jest at Vilna. And altars are set up to him after his death, and so all is permitted. No, such people, it seems, are not of flesh, but of bronze. In the name of Napoleonic greatness, all is permitted. But Raskolnikov is no Napoleon, and this gradual realization comes to eat him alive through the course of the novel. The mere fact of him feeling so much guilt, being so tormented about the murder, precludes him from attaining the greatness of Napoleon. Surely, Raskolnikov reasons, a man of Napoleon's greatness would commit a simple murder like this without second thought. The man who wastes half a million men in the Moscow expedition wouldn't think twice about killing an old pawnbroker. Yet, Raskolnikov is devastated. If only he would have been a Napoleon, his murder would have been justified. Right? Right? The really interesting question is, does Dostoevsky agree with his character? And the answer is, definitely not. In fact, Dostoevsky would disagree with Raskolnikov that even Newton would be justified in killing hundreds to bring the Principia Mathematica to the world, let alone Napoleon, whose contributions to mankind are decidedly less unambiguously good. Dostoevsky, after all, was a Christian, and it's through the lens of Christianity that we need to look and see why he disagrees with Raskolnikov so vehemently. Raskolnikov is always concerned with the annihilation of others. He throws Newton into a hypothetical scenario where he would have to step over corpses to publish his theories. He considers Napoleon great precisely because he is willing to throw men into the meat grinder to reach his goals. But for Dostoevsky, greatness lies not in the annihilation of the other, but in the annihilation of the self. Because the ideal man for Dostoevsky is, of course, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who sacrificed himself in service of others by willingly dying on the cross. It's a complete inversion of Raskolnikov's worldview, who, in his egoism, is only concerned with the aggrandizement of the self, whereas the truly great man, exemplified in the figure of Jesus Christ, is only concerned with the annihilation of the self. In the novel, this perspective is typified in the character of Sonia. Sonia is a devout, sensitive woman who nevertheless finds herself on the path of corruption. Forced to sell her body because of her father's drinking problem, she ultimately convinces Raskolnikov to confess to his crime because she is worried for his soul. But whereas Raskolnikov sins only for himself, Sonia sins for others. And whereas Napoleon lived only for himself, Jesus died for others. In Dostoevsky's view, Napoleon and Jesus inhabit completely different moral universes, just as Raskolnikov and Sonia in the novel do. After the death of his first wife, Dostoevsky wrote the following in his diary. Meanwhile, since the appearance of Christ as a human ideal in flesh, it has become clear as day that the highest, the final development of personality should exactly reach the point by which man will have found, realized and made sure with all forces of his nature that the highest use which man can make of his personality, of the full development of his I, is to destroy that I somehow, to give it fully away to each and every one, 
completely and unconditionally. This is the Christian ideal, a life in service of others to the point where the I or the ego merges with mankind so as to become indistinguishable. In the same section, Dostoevsky notes that this is impossible for us mortal beings, but nevertheless, it is a worthy striving. What is decidedly an unworthy striving is whatever Napoleon desired, earthly fame and martial glory. In fact, Dostoevsky is even a skeptic where scientific progress is concerned. Let's circle back to Newton for a bit. Raskolnikov's position is that Newton would be justified in killing people, if those people somehow prevented the publication of his theories. Between the lines, Dostoevsky wonders if such a hypothetical loss of life, the committing of such great sins, would be worth it at all, because scientific and cultural progress only concerns the material, earthly life of humans, not the spiritual side of our existence. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? That Dostoevsky assigns infinitely more importance to the spiritual life of humanity than to the material, earthly existence is perhaps best exemplified by the following fragment of a letter he wrote. In this letter, he's discussing Darwinism, which was a new theory at the time, but it shows clearly that Dostoevsky's primary concern is not man's existence on earth, but man's existence in spirit. Christ declares directly that, besides belonging to the animal world, man also belongs to the spiritual world. Well then, it does not really matter what man's origins are. The Bible does not explain how God molded him out of clay or carved him out of stone, but it does say that God breathed life into him. In conclusion, Napoleon was for Dostoevsky not a man to be emulated, because Jesus Christ represented the most perfect development of one's personality. And the life of Jesus Christ, and of course his death, were exemplified by selfless service to others, whereas Napoleon's life was characterized by self-aggrandizement. Napoleon and Jesus are total moral opposites, just like Raskolnikov and Sonia in the novel. And of course, it's ultimately through Sonia's Christ-like eternal understanding and compassionate suffering that Raskolnikov attains redemption and is ultimately saved. Thank you for watching. And thank you to all our Patreons for their support of the channel. If you want to join their ranks and get access to a dozen Patreon-exclusive videos, check out the link in the description. Your support is greatly appreciated and keeps the channel alive. With that said, thanks again for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.